welcome back to Healing Conversations with Coach V. I'm Coach V, Certified Life Coach and Personal Growth Expert with SVM Initiatives, LLC. Okay, so I know I've been away for like 50, 11 years, and I know y'all see I'm gold at the top now, ow. So I'm back, I'm, I'm revamped, I'm ready. We're doing something off the cuff today, brand new. So please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube at Coach V, The Healing Coach. And find us on Facebook at Healing Conversations with Coach V. I'm always accepting guests and I interact with you. So you talk to me, I'm going to talk to you. Okay, so I was kind of being wordy in my intro to give my special guest a little time to calm his nerves because um, he'd be clowning like all the time. So I'm not even going to look at him while I'm introducing him. But um, I have a guest here today, someone who I call my big brother. He told me he's not, but I kind of treat him like he is. Um, and it's Vernon. Vernon Allen is in the building. And this is his first debut because he's already told me he's coming back. So what we're going to do today is a little bit different um, from our last episodes. We usually have people come on who share with us a challenging life situation that they experience and they share with us either a product or service that was birthed from overcoming that challenge. So whether they wrote a book or wrote a play or began a nonprofit, today we're doing something special. Vernon and I are just going to have just a real conversation about the challenges as well as the possibilities of overcoming past hurts in life. So I'm very interested and a little bit nervous to see where this conversation goes today. So Vernon. Yes. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Was, was that intro okay? Yes. Are you sure? Yes, yes, yes. I ain't going to get fine. a flag tomorrow. No, 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 you're fine. So you're fine. the reason why I say that, because Vernon and I have the, I guess it's the privilege, quote unquote. Um, uh, working together at our nine to fives. So whatever happens today, like I got to see this man at nine o'clock in the morning. Right. So uh, <laughs> see, that's what I'm talking about. So sharp. I'm gonna be on point. Sharp. I'm gonna be on sharp. point. So Vernon, before we get started, like into the meat and potatoes, you want to take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to the people. <clears throat> My name is Vernon Allen. Um, I'm originally from Middletown, Ohio. I live in Cincinnati now. I've been here since 2007. Um, I really like the city. Uh, the city has been has been good to me, so I really like the city. So I'm here. We're glad you're here, Vernon. Thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. You're quite welcome. So much. You're quite welcome. <laughs> All right. So he from Middletown, but we ain't gonna hold that against him. He's in a five one three now. Um, Middletown is five one three as well. Um, you're in a real five one three, like the Natty. Again, we're not going to hold it against you, so I understand, I understand. let's not push it. All right. Um, no, seriously. So we're going to talk about healing from past hurts, right? And we're going to share, you know, different ways because, again, the show is inspirational. So we want people to watch this. If they're dealing with something or just came out of something, I want them to be able to get some tips and some tidbits and some techniques. Like, you know what? They make sense. That may work for me. So let me try that out for myself. So with that being the intent, I'm going to put the ball in your court. How you want to start, sir? Well, <clears throat> my hurt that I had was the fact that I felt responsible for my father who had a stroke. Okay. Um, my father had a stroke. He had high blood pressure. Um, and he didn't tell his family that he had high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So I advise all men, get yourself together. Get a daily check. Get a monthly checkup. Make sure your, your body is in line because it's very important. But to say that um, he had a stroke um, one night, it was at the end of August. We uh, sat out on the porch and, you know, we had a good old conversation. Um, we had a few cocktails. Uh, we talked, felt like we had some bonding time. Mm -hmm. And then he went off to bed like he normally do. And uh, the next morning, I went to, I noticed that he wasn't up. So I went to wake him up and he was talking to me, but he never opened his eyes. Mm -hmm. And it kind of bothered me. I said, well, we did kick it, you know, a little, we had a little Henny that so night. Yeah, yeah, hey, look, I said, oh, yeah, right, he, right. he messed up. I said, I'm, I went on to work. And um, when I came back about 5.30, he was still in the bed, and I found that unusual for my father because mm -hmm. usually he'd be up, be moving. So I said, ah, 
didn't pay it no attention. One, I had other things going on. I was selfish. I was more worried about what I was going to do in them streets okay. and, you know, things of that nature. So I didn't pay it no attention. So he laid in the bed. And then that next morning, he was still laying in the bed. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to him. <clears throat> excuse me. I was talking to him, and he was, he was still responsive and talking to me, but he never opened his eyes. Mm -hmm. So I then, then began to worry and so I went on to work, and, and I said, by the time I come back, if he's not up yet, I'm going to take him to the hospital. So sure enough, he wasn't up yet. So I called my friend over from Middletown, Mr. Steve Burris. Middy's in the house, represent. <laughs> I called, called Mr. Burris over, and he helped me get my father dressed. Okay. And he helped me take my father to the car. And we went to Miami Valley Hospital, which is in Dayton, Ohio. And I rushed in, and I was talking to my dad the whole time we was driving. And he was an OG, an old player, mm. is that what you want to call it. He was talk I was talking to him, and the whole time I was talking to him, he would just say, yeah, yeah. But he was fixing his hat like, yeah, yeah, yeah. With his but eyes he, closed. he never opened his eyes. Mm -hmm. And so I got him, to, got him to the hospital, and... Got into the emergency room and I ran in so hysterical because like like look my father he, I don't know what's wrong with him, so they rushed him in and and so they did test after test after test and then they come back and they f told me that he had a stroke and it was really it was really heartfelt to me and I felt so guilty my anger turned into guilt because I talked to him and I'm like well. If I'd have known you had a stroke, I could have prevented the the severe the severity of the stroke. I could have, you know, and but I didn't know. That's why I say it's important for men, black men, to get a yearly checkup, monthly checkup, or what have you. It's important to stay on top of your health. Um, so let me let me ask you this real quick. What what aspect exactly did you feel guilty about? Because you didn't know. So I didn't did you know, feel but guilty about? I felt that if I could have got him to the hospital in time sooner, I got you sooner. Yeah, then he wouldn't. He would have not been bad off the way he was. He was paralyzed on one side. He couldn't talk. Um, he could comprehend, mm -hmm. but he couldn't talk and. It messed me up because I would talk to him. And I'm like, Dad, what's going on? You know, of that nature. Sad, yeah, and I couldn't, you know, but yet he was still, he was still, he was still in his mind and he was still funny with it mm -hmm. because I would, um, I would go visit him and he would still try to be funny. And I'm like, Dad, don't sound like that. You know, you, you're making me have jokes. And he's like, you know, he just, but I felt so guilty, so bad about it, man. Like, I felt like if I would have paid more attention to you than myself, you would, you would have not been bad off. Mm -hmm. And I was, it just, it messed me up. I mean, I went, I was so angry at myself to, I got to the point to where I didn't care mm -hmm. about how I looked. Mm -hmm. I didn't care. If I bathed or not, all I wanted to do was drink and, and try to ease the pain, ease the anger and the guilt. And finally, it wasn't working, so I did turn to drugs. Mm -hmm. And drugs wasn't, drugs wasn't the answer. Right. But yet, I still had that pain, that guilt, that hurt, that anger. I beat myself up daily. Vernon, how can you let your father... Lay up there in the bed and have a stroke while you out running the streets. Mm -hmm. How could you do that? I mean, this was a daily, daily, daily thing I struggled with. And I just, one day I just said, God, I don't know what's going on, but can you take it away? Mm -hmm. Can you can you lift the burdens from me? And to this day, I still get a little emotional, but I know that... Um, I finally forgave myself mm -hmm. because it was it was hard at first. It, like I said, it was very hard at first to forgive myself. I kept apologizing to my little brother. Bro, I'm sorry that 
I let our father go down like that. I apologize to his sister, which is my aunt. Annie, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And they kept, why are you apologizing? It's not your fault. Yes, it is my fault because I was so wrapped up to what into what I had going on. Mm -hmm. Didn't pay attention to my loved one, somebody who was very dear to me. And it was it was it was really a bad experience for me. So let's let's unpack this a little bit because as I always say, there's sometimes there's people in the back that ain't really receiving what's being put down. And I, and of course I do want to go into talking about at the point that you decided to forgive yourself and the steps that you took to do that. But before we get to that, help us all understand if, I don't know how you want to call it, logically, scientifically, physically, whatever reason, if you knew that directly it wasn't your fault because you didn't know, you weren't aware, you didn't have the knowledge, and we already know that had you had the knowledge, you would have moved different. So knowing that you didn't have the knowledge, what space were you in that made you feel like, no, I'm going to keep blaming myself? Even though, yeah, I didn't know, and I know we had cocktails, and he could have been sleeping it off. Right. At what point was it, no, you know what, I'm going to keep blaming myself. This this is me. It's my fault. Give us an insight on mentally what, what was going on. What was your thought process that every time it creeped up that, Vernon, you didn't know, whether your aunt told you, whether your brother told you, Vernon, you didn't know. What was going on that made Vernon push back and say, no, it's still my fault? Because I want people to understand how that happens and how it moves to forgiveness. It brought, it took me to a dark, dark place. I mean, every time I try to find light or comfort, so to speak, there was something in my mind saying, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. It's your fault. And... I lived for the last year or two after he passed, mm -hmm. really believing that it was my fault. Mm -hmm. um, and this sounds kind of funny. Even when the insurance money came, mm -hmm. I said, well, let me live a little bit. That just made it even worse. Mm -hmm. Felt even more guilty. How can you spend insurance? How can you spend the insurance money? knowing you was the one that caused your daddy to die. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was horrible, man. It was, you don't want nobody to go through that. Mm -hmm. But we be so wrapped up and tied up in our own affairs to where we forget about the ones that, that's close to us, that's truly dear to us, that we love. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about it now, just talking to you now, mm -hmm. It almost want to take me to a dark place. Mm -hmm. I am really sitting here trying to hold my composure. I really want to break down, cry, stop the tape. I, but, nah, let's talk about this. Let's, let me release some stuff. Let me get this stuff out. Let me take a moment then in this space to thank you for coming and talking about it. Not only talking about it, but choosing to continue instead of hitting me with the stop the tape and walking off. So I appreciate that. And listening to you reminds me of, as again, as a certified life coach and personal growth expert, I also have a component of uh, mental health advocacy. Right. So that's important because when I listen to you say, you know, regardless of who was trying to comfort you or what your family was saying, there was still a little voice telling you, it's your fault. It's your fault. Right. How could you do this? How could you spend this money? So on and so forth. Right. And I think that's such an important thing to discuss because a lot of times we feel like as a society, if I can't see the pain, it's not there. Right. If I come in with a cast on my arm, I'm going to get all the attention because I have something physical for you to see. Like, oh, you're hurting. Right. But if it's not physical, and even if we try to reach out for help, people look at us like, but I don't see it, so get over it. It ain't your fault. Get over it. You know, so one of the things I teach my clients is that in order for me to take a harmful thought from you, I have to replace it with something else. Because if I don't, when you get in that situation again, you're going to go back to what you know, which right. is that harmful thought. Right, 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 right. So one of the things that I would say in this instance where when those thoughts come up, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, Probably doing an exercise of whether it's logic or whether it's spiritual, 
or whether it's emotional of, okay, when this thought comes up and tells me it's your fault, what can I replace it with? What can I counteract it with? The first most obvious answer is it's not your fault, right? That's right, that's right. the um, opposite of it's your fault. Right. But sometimes the pain is so deep that's not enough. I need to hear more than it's not, it's not my fault. You know, make it, it make was, sense to me. It was so deep till I began to take it out on other people. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, the pain, I tried to hide the pain and I couldn't hide it, but it was so deep. I would, I would talk about you, laugh at you. If your mama died and her wig was, was crooked, savage. I would just talk about your mom. Didn't care whose feelings I hurt it, whether it was your mama's, the pastor's, the pastor's wife, didn't care, <laughs> didn't care. All I was trying to do was make myself feel better. Mm -hmm. And folks would be like, oh, you silly, you funny, you funny. But deep down inside, I was really crying out right. for help. Like, right. can somebody please help me? I need help. And it was just, uh, it was just the worst experience. I want to add to your directive at the beginning of our conversation when you looked into your camera and, and told our men, you know, get yourself checked out, make sure your body together. I want to look into my camera and add to the component about it's not just the physical, the mental right. is just as important, if not more, because in our community, the black community, right? right? So there's a stigma surrounding mental health. Right. We don't talk about it. We put Uncle Johnny upstairs in the attic. Don't nobody go talk right. to him. We Let him alone. Let him alone. He ain't right in the head. Right, right, right. You know, but there are so many people walking around struggling with something. With, with something. Whether it's short term, whether it's long term, there's so many people struggling with something. And we have to do better as a community. Right, right. With listening to when our people are calling out for help. Right. So you went into using vices, as I call them, drinking, drinking, substance abuse, substance abuse. Yes, yes, yes. Even, even mentally abusing women. Okay. I mentally abuse my kid's mother. Mm -hmm. Didn't physically abuse her, but mentally abuse her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As far as name calling, um, told her she wasn't worth nothing. Called her stupid. Mm -hmm dummies, you know, things of that nature. Um, our mental health is really important. Um, people think that because a person is a certain way, mm -hmm. that's just how they are. Yeah. That's not true. It's, it's something going on in the inside. I agree. In the inside that they need to, you know, have looked at. And we, as the black community, we tend to over, like you said, overlook that. Mm -hmm. we tend mm -hmm. to brush it off like, oh, that's just how that person is. And mm -hmm. No, you might want to get that checked out. What was your breaking point? What was the point that made Vernon say, when you cried out to God, what point were you at where you had just had enough of the guilt, the pain, the hurt? What was going on at that time? When I was so low to, I was almost homeless. I was so depressed, so angered. To really, it really messed me up. Mm -hmm. I, I was almost on the street, mm -hmm. and then one day I just cried out, "Lord, help me, mm -hmm. help me!" And it took a little while. I didn't come at an instant. Mm -hmm. It took a little while, but it was rough. I always tell people, whether I'm speaking to a group or doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, that when we cry out to our higher power, whoever that is, we can't be so impatient because we didn't get an answer immediately. We right. have to give spirit time to move. Because right. we didn't built up all these layers and layers of stuff and crud, and then we expect by the snap of the finger for it to move quick. And then we right. get discouraged. And then we may even become blasphemous. Right. But we have to be patient and faithful and diligent because when spirit moves, it moves. It, well, you were absolutely so share, right. So share with us how it moved for you. Well, the spirit broke me down. Um, one day I was sitting in my apartment. I didn't have no lights. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I didn't have no food in the refrigerator. And was on the verge of the water being cut off. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't stop bawling. I couldn't stop crying. It was like an uncontrollable cry. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my mind, like, I feel all right, but then what's wrong with me? I couldn't stop weeping. Mm -hmm. And then finally some said to me, you need to pick yourself up. You need to just let that go and keep moving. Because if you don't, you're going to end up dead. Mm -hmm. Whether it's drinking yourself to death, whether it's going out here doing something stupid, mm -hmm. you need to pull it together. Mm -hmm. And with the help of some of my friends, I pulled it together. So what did you do? Well, first I started reading about body, soul, and mind. Okay. Um, I started learning how to get a control of my thoughts mm -hmm. because your thoughts will slip away from you. True. They will slip away. Um, then um, I start meditating, and meditating is really helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about I've meditated to the point to where I was – in the in between conscious and unconscious sleep or what have you. Oh, listen to the yeah. morning. Okay then. Yeah, and and just listening and, and studying and reading and that really brought me out of out of that anger, that guilt, mm -hmm. that hurt, that depression. Um like I say, it wasn't easy. It is not. I, I it teach wasn't my easy. clients prayer is when you ask for something. Meditation is when you listen for the response. So you quiet yourself, you be still, and sometimes it's something that you really aren't used to or don't want to hear. But more often than not, because I, I don't want to use an absolute and say 100% of the time, but more often than not, that answer is the move you need to make to heal. Right, right. Period. So when you said it wasn't easy, share with us the things that you did to push through that healing moment. Well, um, being the fact that I did turn to alcohol as a comfort, um, it wasn't easy to just stop drinking. It wasn't easy at all. Mm -hmm. um, it gradually slowed down mm -hmm. from every day. Then it went to maybe every other day. Mm -hmm. Then it went to once a week. It wasn't like I just stopped immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm hearing from you is that for some people, cold turkey or all of a sudden may work. But for other people, right, right, to be realistic and, and understand that a win is a win. So whether it's five drinks to three drinks, it's still a win. Right, it's and still a win. celebrate that win. Um, I feel people that quit cold turkey... Mm -hmm doing more harm to themselves than good because I mean I mean you can quit cold turkey mm -hmm. you can but look at all the withdrawals yeah. so you weaned yourself off I weaned and I'm still not weaned yet <laughs> it's still a working process yeah Lord. I mean you know I mean I'm gonna be honest with you um there's been moments to where I've been I found myself trying to slip back into that dark place yeah and I'm looking like there's a drink around here somewhere. Somewhere, I mean, right, yeah, yeah. right. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, water. <laughs> it's water. We checked before yeah, we water, started recording. Water. Okay. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> you just can't, like I said, you can't wing yourself. You can't just quit cold turkey. You have to wing yourself yeah. off. And yeah, that's what I've done. So these interviews always get so juicy and the time always goes so quick. So we're down to like our last five minutes. But I want to make sure. We just sure. got started. I know, right? I guess that's why I got to have you back. I'm just now Ugh. getting warmed up. Oh, my gosh. So at the point that you begin, let me just flat out ask you, are you healed now? Am I healed? Over that particular situation? Or is it still a work in progress? I'm going to put it to you like this. I'm not what I used to be. Yes. I am a working process. There's things I need to work on. 
It takes time. But I'm far mm-hmm. from that dark place. You're still winning. A win is a win. A win is a win. Got you was absolutely you. right. Got a win is a, is, is a win. <laughs> so, Whether it's by one point, two points. It's still a win. It's still a, a W. <laughs> it's still a W. So while you're looking in the camera, you mind telling the people who are watching us on YouTube and who's watching us on Spectrum something that got you through, whether it was an encouraging scripture, a statement, a mantra you came up for yourself? Well, I'm going to tell you, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's what got me through. Mm-hmm. That is exactly what got me through. Because when situations would cause my mind to go back to that dark place, whether it was... Uh, a remembrance, whether it was a date or or a particular brand name, like a brand name drink. Well, we would, me and my father was drinking that night. I would close my eyes and say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And that got me through. Okay. That got me through. And surround yourself with positive people. There you go. Boom. Association. Like Coach V. Associations. Here we go. Surround yourself with Coach V. <laughs> Coach V is the truth, y'all. She the truth. But anyway. We're going to have to bring... Okay, I'm going to say it now on camera. We're going to have to bring Vernon back there. Please okay. do. So, because this episode, we're done. Like We it's, better not be done. We're, we're done. It's I didn't drive all the way down here for five minutes. We See? better not be done. See this? I know we ain't done. So, thank you for tuning in to this week's episode Thank you all. of Healing Conversations with Coach V. That's me, Coach V, certified Men, life take coach care of yourself. and personal growth expert with SVM Initiatives, LLC. Like us and subscribe on YouTube to keep track of all new episodes that we're uploading. And remember, mental health is just as important as physical health. We'll see you next time.